everyone, and thank you for joining us for the fifth episode of the ongoing Zoom event series, Empire or Utopia. Today, I am honored to have with me uh, Mr. Dean Chang, and together we'll be talking about what pop culture narratives through television and science fiction novels can tell us about China in space. And if you have an opportunity to look up Mr. Cheng, um, he has a very distinguished biography and I will not um, embarrass him by going into immense amounts of details here, uh, but please know he is a senior advisor to the China program at the US Institute of Peace and has uh, quite a lengthy career uh, working through the national security, foreign affairs, and policy perspectives associated with Chinese activities in this era of global competition. Uh, so with that, please note that um, I am the chair for the Space Law Interest Group, the vice chair um, with the American Society of International Law, and I'm also active duty Navy. Please note that I do this volunteer work in my personal capacity and that any statements that you hear from me today are not reflective of the Department of Defense, the Department of the Navy, or any other government representative. They are my own comments and my own uh, personal thoughts alone. Uh, we are going to talk today about the Three Body Problem trilogy, specifically the first book, The Three Body Problem, the second, The Dark Forest, and Death's End. Of course, we could do multiple weeks uh, about this particular universe, um, but we're going to stick to those books exclusively, and we will not be venturing into the television show, so just for your own framing. Um, we're also going to talk about the Serenity and Firefly universe and The Expanse. So uh, with that brief introduction, uh, Dean, thank you so much for joining us and sharing your expertise. Maybe you could begin um, by distinguishing these three narratives that we plan on discussing today. Well, uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to be here. It's uh, truly uh, an honor and also a fascinating opportunity to meld two interests of mine, uh, China and science fiction. Um, what I think we see when we look at uh, Serenity Firefly, when we look at um, The Expanse, when we look at The Three Body Problem, are interesting aspects of how China is, is visualized, is envisioned as influencing uh, space, space activities of being a space player. Um, so if we look at... Um, the Serenity Firefly universe. Uh, there we see that uh, in the verse, China is pretty much a co-equal. Uh, we see, for example, in the background, and it's always interesting to look more in the background because that's sort of both deliberate, but also it's a sign of what is sort of common in that universe. We see signage, we see instructions that are in English and Chinese. We see loan phrases among the actors uh, clearly borrowed from Chinese. And to their credit, they actually had a Chinese person writing those phrases. So it's not just something that sounds Chinese. It actually is Chinese. And I'll just note that uh, Joss Whedon, in his continuation of the Firefly universe in his comic books, actually regularly includes Chinese characters as part of the dialogue. The implication being that this is something that is spoken Conscious, uh, unconsciously by the various uh, people populating this universe that, that they include words that as naturally as we do rendezvous or hancho uh, in our day-to-day -day language. When we look at the expanse, which is obviously much more recent, um, we don't see as much of an overt Chinese governmental role, but uh, whether it is the patois of the belters or the fact that there are Chinese and other Asians scattered throughout uh, the solar system. Um, there, again, they are part of that universe, but I think that the writers were a little less uh, specific about trying to draw attention to that. The three body problem, of course, is different again, because it is a Chinese science fiction novel. And that is particularly important in this context, because what we see, especially in the three body about problem, but across all three novels, is a very Chinese perspective, not just on space, 
but more importantly, bringing Chinese culture and Chinese perspectives to the whole gamut of issues, including the very uh, longstanding trope, what happens if we encounter unfriendly aliens? I think that's all really insightful. And um, I'd like to hear your thoughts too on the creation of these universes, because as we've spoken about, Firefly and the Serenity verse are um, kind of space westerny in the sense that we're thinking about the captain of a vessel who has survived this civil war, terrible type of um, conflict in space and is a damaged person, you know, trying to keep his crew safe as he goes through this universe. And Serenity, of course, expands upon that because it has you know, the Reavers with, you know, their um, space pirate type activities that are really, you know, venturing into torture and cannibalism in a way that escalates any political acts that happen in the real world. Um, so we have, we have that, but it's more than Joss Whedon's comic books, right? It's specific decisions made by set directors and movies. And I was wondering if you could just talk about what that deliberate choice to design the sets the way that they did tells us about how that verse shows China and China's influences far in the future as it relates to Serenity and Firefly. So I think one of the interesting things is, and somebody pointed this out years and years ago about the very first Star Wars movie uh, in terms of release, not in terms of timeline of this of this series, which is that, you know, Obi-Wan Kenobi and Luke Skywalker are driving around in a very used <laughs> land speeder. This is a universe where stuff is not all bright and shiny. Compare that, for example, with Star Trek, where the ship longstanding, uh, captained by you know, Robert April and by, by um, Christopher Pike already, nonetheless is bright and shiny. Um, and so when we look at Serenity, what's interesting is that, you know, you have the inner worlds, wealthier worlds where uh, River Tam and, and um, you know, the Tams are from, and that's a lot shinier. But out towards the edges where the series mostly occurs, it's dusty, it's second hands and hand-me-downs and a lot of patches. And it is nonetheless a universe or or uh, space region where the Chinese stuff is part and parcel. So again, it's the idea is that the Chinese are part of this universe, not necessarily fenced off to one region or another. The best comparison I would draw to that, again, in terms of set design and the like, actually would be Blade Runner. And it's fascinating when you compare the original Blade Runner, which was made in the 1980s, and where Japanese is everywhere, again, from a cultural perspective. So while Harrison Ford is not walking around speaking Japanese, he's eating at Japanese-style noodle bars, and all the neon is in Japanese. And now fast forward to Blade Runner 2049, I think that's the uh, name of it, um, where... Ryan uh, Gosling is walking right in front of Korean neon because in the time frame from 1984 to 2024, we've watched Japan fade quite a bit economically and Korea, specifically South Korea, become much more of a player. And I think that's one of the interesting things about the Serenity universe is that it occurs when real life, China had become much more prominent as you know, this is the country of the future. China may still be the country of the future. It remains the number two GDP in the world. But what's fascinating is that from a pop culture perspective, Korea has already at least become a rival to the Chinese. And when you think about, for example, how many people can name, I can't, any Chinese pop groups, but everyone's heard of BTS right. and K-pop. Yeah. That's, a, again, a reflection of how popular culture then casts a shadow forward in the mindset of the set designers and the writers and the like into to what do you put into the background? What do you put as the neon? What do you put as the instructions and what language is on the OSHA uh, yellow and black tape? Yeah, I, I think that is really important to think about because when I think of um, the Expanse and Serenity Firefly universes as you've described them, it is an evolving process 
and that used character of the universe that's expressed re reflects a Chinese influence that's on par with the influence of all the other great powers as it's developed. Do you have, please um, contribute. So it is how, for those specific shows, it is how Americans and Westerners conceive of that Chinese role. Oh, and yeah. I think that's very important to highlight because, again, going back to the three body problem universe, that's not necessarily how the Chinese envision. That's right. And that's yeah. exactly where I was going with that. So I, I love that we're thinking about this kind of in that same direction, because these American shows designed by Americans showing China as an equal contributor such that old signs show Chinese phrases and Chinese language is incorporated as part of dialogue, whether it's a panel in a comic book or something an actor is saying in a way that's on par with all of those other developmental factors. And then when you contrast that to the three body problem, it really highlights the differences between how the, you know, air quotes West as um, the example of the Firefly Serenity expands sees the Chinese influence in space compared to how China, our Chinese author, is projecting what space looks like with China in the lead. So now that we've had this conversation about, you know, that kind of Western thought on what it will look like in the future, I would love to really kind of anchor down a little bit on the three body problem and perhaps spend the rest of our time on that. And I really appreciate um, our ASL support um, Britta Jellen reminding um, all of us that if you have questions, please do submit them into the chat function. Um, at the bottom of your screen, there should be um, a Q&A chat function. And if you pop that in there, we definitely are interested in your thoughts. So please don't hesitate. Um, but now that we're gonna talk a little bit more about that, um, you know, we, we think about these three books, they all seem to really challenge those American or Western ideas about how the earth would be defended if they were threatened by an alien invasion. And readers are really kind of presented with those three different Chinese responses to an invasion by a technologically advanced alien society. And just to be very grossly general, we could say that those three options might be you know, running um, surrendering or being annihilated in some kind of way, or really, I think this is something that you had mentioned to me previously, we become pets. <laughs> and so it's really fascinating because, you know, uh, Reynolds family tradition is we watch Independence Day every 4th of July. Right? <laughs> He'll be my president forever. But, you know, that's, that is not like as an American person, what consuming American pop culture, that is not what we think, what I think about. It's not what my children think about. It's not what my friends who laugh when I post it on Facebook about how we're watching it for the umpteenth time think about. And um, so I think it would be beneficial, uh, Dean, to hear your thoughts about that. Well, I mean, I think that uh, one of the things to consider is, you know, first off, when we encounter aliens in the movies, they always fall into one of two categories, it seems. They are either nice and friendly and cuddly, and either we understand or misunderstand them. E.T. is the classic example of this, right? Uh, you really couldn't ask for a more positive encounter, um, you know, and and it's we're the ones who, who sort of mess things up. But that was also true for the day the Earth stood still. Mm -hmm. um, and then you have the bad aliens. And that covers a wide gamut, everything from, uh, you know, extremely scary biological xenomorphs uh, chest bursting out uh, at the dinner table to more specifically aliens who come mm. to destroy us. And I think that the vast bulk of the bad, well, leave the good aliens for a different time, but the, the bad alien thing almost always then faces resistance at an individual level, Ripley and the crew running through the Nostromo, Ripley and the Marines running around Asheron, war a la Independence Day, but also the George Powell War of the Worlds, right? Uh, the general in charge, you know, is, uh, you know, the atomic bomb has failed. Uh, and he says, you know, we'll, we'll fight them back into the mountains. It's up to you scientists to come up with an answer. There's no concept here of surrender. There's not even a concept here of just, you know, breaking up into little guerrilla bands and hoping to survive. Um, Independence Day uh, is another cl classic example, standing on, on the wing of the F-15, giving the speech. Um, plenty of other 
alien invasion movies v if you remember um okay more of a resistance but again we're going yes. to fight them. i used to hide behind the couch and watch v when my parents were watching it <laughs> Still have um, nightmares all on me, all on me. No, but I mean, but it was a fun <laughs> series. But again, you know, Michael Ironsides uh, out there, you know, leading that resistance. Um, what is fascinating is because that is who we are as Westerners. And you can very clearly hear with less of an English accent, Bill Pullman talking about we shall fight them on the beaches. We shall fight them, you know, on on the uh, landing fields, and we shall never surrender. Uh, that is Churchillian. Um, I have to admit, just quick sidebar here, that uh, you know my own personal disappointment for the Battlestar Galactica series, which again is another humans uh, running but fighting, never surrendering, uh, was that they didn't wind up in a terrestrial in the Earth solar system uh, and encounter you know and encountering an already developed Earth. A uh, space force that was going to basically say, "All of you stand down, or we will have no problem nuking you." Because the one thing we have lots of is nukes. Uh, <laughs> I always thought that would have been a really interesting way of ending uh, the reboot. Um, yeah, I was disappointed too. I have to yeah. say, I was uh, like, "What?" And now we're done. Okay, great. <laughs> but, um, but here with the Chinese, particularly in the first book, which sets the stage, we don't see a resistance in the sense of that is not what this author, who, by the way, this book was incredibly popular in China. So it's not a Western phenomena. It's a Western phenomena only in the sense that we discovered this book that had already been a bestseller in China. And somebody said, hey, let's translate this and, and see how it goes. What is the Chinese response? The Chinese response is, as you said, we can maybe try to run, we can just accept our fate and die um, because the aliens have pretty much made clear uh, there ain't going to be an er a Terran Earth civilization left. Or we cut deals and at least some of us survive as essentially pets and slaves. Not we shall fight them and then, you know, if necessary, we, we you know, scorched Earth ourselves, you know, to deny them. I mean, this is this is a very and this goes to and this is the power of the book. The author explains not simply why the main character does what she does, but by setting that as she is the microcosm, she is the sort of individual example of that larger Chinese aspect across five thousand years, that also relevant to this particular form, never developed a sense of democracy. 5,000 years of civilization, there's no history of a Chinese democratic period. And also, across 5,000 years, there was never the rise of rule of law. It was always rule by law. The legal institutions in China, and I'm not talking about the People's Republic of China, I'm talking about Imperial China, was always incredibly weak. The idea of an independent judiciary, of a judicial branch co-equal to the executive, and there was never really a legislature either, but let's imagine that there was, that that never occurred. And all of this then has implications for as China, real world China, becomes more of a space player, the implications for international legal regimes in the space context. I appreciate you bringing that, all of that up, because that distinction between the rule of, of law and the rule by law is one that, you know, as a as a legal practitioner for the past 20 years is something that I would say in the last five years just of my legal practice has become something I've really thought about. And those distinctions among um, like NATO partner nations or other uh, foreign nations that are more aligned with that um, Western type of dichotomy, you know, we, we think about what role those um, institutions in civilian society play as it relates to things like a response to a threat that's existential, like an alien threat would be. Um, if you'll indulge me, I'd like to read a quote from the three body problem. It's when Yen is talking, uh, she's remembering something her father had told her. And um, he goes on and talks about, um, you know, I'm sorry, it's her mother. And um, she's like, oh, Yen, I fooled you. And then she has this little um, reflection. And she says um, that her, I'm, I'm mangling this, my apologies. 
Yin is remembering her mother tell her something that her father had said. And um, I don't think it's a spoiler here to say that one informative event from her past was seeing her father's brutal death at the hands of um, agents of the state, the Red Guard specifically. And so one memory of hers that comes up, she says um, that he had told her mother and her mother had, had told her. In China, any idea that dared to take flight would only crash back to the ground. The gravity of reality is too strong. And again, another indulgence. Um, but when I first read that, I highlighted it because to me, it kind of reflected civil institutions in a way, because part of putting society, putting their faith in an exterior organization to act for the benefit of the society or of the individual is fanciful. You know, we have, we've had a lot of philosophical conversations throughout the course of Western civilization. And I admit my ignorance on the Chinese equivalent for a lot of these, but from a common law perspective, we have Blackstone. We have, I mean, we could go on and on about judges and thinkers. And there is that Star Trek utopia post-scarcity society thought that we as humans can choose to make our society different and better. And when I read that, it was like a smack in the face to think that that idea might be contrary to reality. And if that, that cultural impact on thought development, I know I just threw a bunch of stuff at you, Dean. No. So this is, this is hugely important because this is a cultural issue as much as it is a legal or political issue. I'm glad you brought up Star Trek because I, I did want to go there. Um, when we look at original classic Star Trek, a number of the episodes center upon courtroom cases. Now, here I'm not talking about so much the court martial cases, yeah. which are the more sort of interesting and somewhat of a MacGuffin. But again, look at the background. There is the uh, case of, I am a Star Trek geek, uh, of Mr. Coggle, who specifically cites legal precedent in his demand, in his defense of Captain Kirk and his demand to move the hearings up to the ship. And he cites Magna Carta, the American Constitution, and the Martian Declaration of Fundamental Rights. Um, that says, again, the writers coming from an American perspective during the Cold War, because quite a few of those episodes are not very subtle in, in <laughs> discussing that. But here, what they are saying is, we will have a strong judiciary in space and issues, whether personal or interstellar treaties and, and uh, you know, et cetera, will be negotiated as we think of them, as legal with an independent judiciary making arguments. They interestingly, glancingly touch on this in Star Trek six the voyage home when the daughter of the klingon chancellor yeah you know, when when someone talks about human rights and she says you know typical federation uh you know hubris you know talk about human rights uh, you know that, i thought that was an interesting comment there but why that matters here is again when we look at china when we look at how we have a system that says the gravity of reality let me let me par let me rephrase what the author wrote. The steamroller of reality will drive over opposition, will drive over idealism. Uh, this is five thousand years of culture and history, where the Chinese perception is not that the arc of history bends towards justice. First off, it is the cycles of history, in a sense, again, Battlestar Galactica, that which we uh, see has been before and will be again. So say we uh, all. <laughs> so say we all. But also, as a result, um, you can never be unburdened by what has been. It shapes you. It directs you. It sets very clear limits on what can be change at best is incremental radical change is rare and usually bad lots of i mean you know inter inter dynastic periods are filled with death destruction 
etc. So be careful what you wish for. Um, all in a context where disputes are not going to be reconciled by some external body to whom we grant power willingly in the expectation that they will, at least in theory, treat both of us as equals, which is the core concept of rule of law. Right. Rather, the law, quote unquote, exists to keep those who are in power in power, which scarily is a philosophy we see or argument we see more and more here in the West. And as important, um, if you are going to cede uh, dispute resolution to some third party, you're a fool. Uh, because that way you're very wealthy or you're very, or you have something on the adjudicator. Um, and that moving forward, you know, if you had a Chinese version of serenity or a Chinese version of the expanse, never mind a Chinese version of Star Trek, um, that is the context, the background, culturally, philosophically, thought wise, that would be influencing Malcolm Reynolds or James Holt. And that's a very different view of how the world should work. Again, take it, bring it back to reality. That is the context in which China is already now thinking about anti-satellite counter space operations out to geo, but even more importantly, the cislunar context. Mm. We now know that the Chinese, because they have said so publicly, that they intend to land a human crew on the moon by 2030. It will not be one and done. It's not land, plant a flag, we're good. They are clearly going to be setting up not only longer term facilities on the moon for human habitation, but envision space traffic. And that goes to a fundamental question. Who will set the rules for space traffic management? At a very fundamental level, borrowing again from serenity, what will be the language of cislunar space travel? Mm -hmm. And we know that China excels at filling the gap, you know, because that incremental approach to establishing standards where there are none, not through an adjudicative body that has been vested some type of mandate to act on behalf of either society or individual groups of um, sovereign auton aut autonomous group nations, humans, AI, whatever, you know, instead it's, this is how we do it. And if you want to partner with us, then you're going to do it the way that we do it. And uh, I think that it's, it's very interesting. And if you could also speak for, from the three body problem perspective, when I read the book the first time, my, uh, I was surprised that our hero would use um, her position at the satellite to kind of communicate with the Trisolarans so that they could come and you know use the earth as the solution to their three through their three body problem and that's probably my you know my my ignorance here but i was wondering you know because we have that you know reality is going to smoosh you she's watched um her father be brutally murdered in front of a, a crowd of screaming enthusiastic people and of course that was that shaped you know her reaction to opportunities that presented herself to act and when she was faced with that choice of, you know, even the uh, Trisolarian in the Watchtower, who's like, do not reply, do not respond, because then we'll know where you are and we will come and wipe you out. And she's like, yeah, I think I will click. You know? <laughs> so can you speak to why you think she made that choice, particularly through the lens of how um, the uh, Chinese culture as expressed through the book um, would have influenced her decision making? Well, I think here we should separate uh the personal. I think that she is doing it partly because of her fundamental disillusionment, uh, having watched her father be beaten to death. And as important, there was no justice, right? Um, the people who did this were Red Guards, and they did not particularly suffer for their actions. We find out later that they didn't have wonderful lives, that the system ground them up and spat them out as well. Yeah, very impersonal, right? It's like, right. We, know, we know what side you're on. Um, Oh, well. <laughs> oh, well. So at yeah. a personal level, she is doing this out of vengeance. And that is actually very realistic. When you look at uh, any analysis of where, why do people become spies? Uh, the acronym is MICE. Money, ideology, compromise, and ego. Um, and ego 
can be I'm smarter than anyone else in the room and I can get away with this. And that's Robert Hansen and um, uh, uh, Aldrich. But in some cases, it is ego in the sense that I have been wrong. Uh, you don't appreciate me. You don't appreciate what I've done. You don't appreciate how, yeah. Um, and that this is real life example. So ego, positive and negative, is a major motivator for human actions, including betrayal, um, whether it is betraying your country or betraying humanity. Where I do think that uh, at a broader, more meta level, what is striking about uh, the three body problem about Yan, but also about serenity and um, the expanse is everyone is damaged, right? Serenity, you know, Malcolm uh, Reynolds is driven in part by the battles of Serenity Valley and the failed uh, war and, you know, is nursing his psychological wounds. Uh, he and Clint Eastwood's man with no name, um, would probably understand each other pretty well. Uh, in The Expanse, uh, James Holden is a damaged person. Uh, and in The Three Body Problem, it's very clear that Yen is damaged. Again, it's an interesting comparison to something like um, Star Trek, where people have problems, but they're not damaged in the same way. And those who are, tend to be the people who are the problems in from episode to episode. Again, I'm talking about the original. It gets to motivation, definitely, yes. at the individual level. And I think it's interesting that you bring that up with um, Malcolm Reynolds and James Holden. And then, of course, Yin here, too, because, you know, as individual people, they have that in common. And I'm no psychologist, but I, I don't think I'm going too far on a limb to say that humans in general react to trauma and stress, you know, physiologically in a similar fashion. And what we're, we're seeing here with this Western produced um, science fiction and this um, Chinese produced science fiction is that commonality, you know, where there's been some awful thing that happened, people are trying to, to continue living um, around or through um, that traumatic event and it influences their decision-making. So that's the individual component. And then when we think about it uh, culturally, I, I think that from a Western perspective, we overcome, we keep fighting, you know, we love each other and support each other and that will help us triumph in this adversity. Um, is, does the th three body problem have, I mean, it doesn't, <laughs> you know, I mean, it's- uh, Not on Yan's part. thought uh, about that. Not right. on her I mean, part. Right, what right. we do see is efforts yeah. to create some kind of alternative, which we see in the second book, uh, um, where basically, um, and. To be fair to the author, he's Chinese. Guess what? He's probably going to have Chinese people be the main characters in all of his books and be the her hero in the sense of coming up with some solution. But in the second book, what is, again, very striking, and again, let's pull this out to, to 20,000 feet, 30,000 feet, is, again, the underlying assumption, going back to our dichotomy of aliens. Uh, here I'm going to point to Carl Sagan. And... Sagan basically runs through this massive equation about how many alien species might be out there, et cetera. And one of his key assumptions is that they must be peaceful if you're going to do interstellar travel. Mm -hmm. um, because, and this was his own opinion, gussied up with some numbers and in an equation that so looks scientific and objective. Nothing says objective like the integration uh, symbol from calculus. If I, can, <laughs> if I can use that, I'm, I'm objective. <laughs> Uh, um, uh. is the idea that, um, you know, to go into outer space, you have to have scientific advancement. To be scientifically advanced, you must probably have unlocked the secrets of the atom, but you didn't blow yourself up. So his aliens are all going to be ETs, almost by definition. Mm -hmm. And the underlying presumption laid out in the second book is... Well, there may be many species out there and everybody is deliberately quiet, hence the very title of the book, The Dark Forest. Don't attract attention by making noise because somebody is out there. You know, the, the Fermi paradox is not a paradox. The Fermi paradox is, in fact, the Fermi law 
which is there's going to be one or more species out there that's just going to squish any and every species, other species that they run across as they wander across the galaxy and the universe. Now, that is a fundamentally pessimistic view. Carl Sagan's is a fundamentally optimistic view. Um, I'm not so sure that I would agree with Sagan, uh, which doesn't mean we should immediately you know, clamp down on all electromagnetic emissions from, from Earth, but rather... This goes again to that more fundamental underlying concept in China highlighted by the quote you read earlier, that gravity of reality is going to bring things crashing down. You may want to believe that the aliens are all ETs, are all you know um, uh, close encounters of the third kind, you know, nice and friendly. But when we encounter them, in the milliseconds before they zorch Earth, we're going to realize, oh, crap, we were wrong. And that is what you know, the author is saying in his second book, is this is the underlying reality. And oh, by the way, I'm right. Because when I create, I, I hope your listeners have, uh, you know, don't mind, because this is probably a bit of a spoiler. <laughs> um, you know, when we basically create a decoy civilizational signature elsewhere somebody came along and zorches it promptly Absolutely. yeah because so, there's no um klatu barata niktu that's going to come and save you right like if it's right. if you if you put your head up you're going to get it taken off yes and, and that is so fascinating because that dark forest deterrence piece um you probably remember from um the book itself how there's those maritime strategy analogies that were quite bahamian in their in their approach to how to organize those space fleets um, and then, of course, we have the real world example in the maritime environment that led to ex to the outer space law considerations of rescuing astronauts or returning um, any type of um, space space um, object that reenters Earth's orbit and lands somewhere outside of where it was launched. You know, all of those concepts, I mean, in, in my opinion, can be directly related back to um, our experiences as a civilization in areas outside the jurisdiction of any one state, specifically on the high seas. You know, that's where we get our concepts like force majeure, you know, the safety of life at sea, where if you recognize that someone is in distress afloat and you're able to assist, that you do. You know, if, there, if an astronaut's in trouble, we will help them. You know, if there's a splash zone that is you know in international waters and there is a, a foreign vessel that's not the same nationality as that astronaut that vessel comes and helps you know those types of concepts um, are part of that evolutive structure that we've been talking about all along about civil institution and judicial body development but then dark forest deterrence but what you have cited is again maritime law as understood in the west yes where to be fair to us the it, maritime law has largely been a Western artifact uh, in the sense like that I think, it, I think Thucydides would probably recognize some of these concepts or some other, you know, ancient seafaring nation. Um, but, you know, from a Chinese perspective, I'd love to hear your thoughts on on that. Well, we have the case back in, I want to say, around 20, 2009, 2010. Two U.S. minesweepers were operating in the Western Pacific, I think okay. in the Philippine Sea. Uh, we had a, an impending major typhoon, uh, and they wanted to put into Hong Kong. Mm -hmm. And the response was no. <laughs> Correct. Um, yes, in violation of no law per se, it is sovereign territory. Hong Kong had already reverted, so it's, uh, yeah, it is Chinese territory. Chinese have a right to allow and not allow. But clearly in violation of maritime custom that says in peacetime, and we are in peacetime, um, you know, Ships are granted shelter from impending natural disasters because the sea shows no favors. But the Chinese attitude was, nope. Well, nope. and China is also a signatory to the 1974 International Convention on the Safety of Life at Sea. But perhaps from a, and we see these same arguments raised in litigation associated with the South China Sea, right? You know, yes, you know, yes, we're signatories, but you're wrong. We're not in violation of the treaty. And it is a factual um, legal argument where we're right and you're wrong. So um, it, it's an interesting approach to those um, types of disagreements. Um, it is. Yeah, but it here is. here also, right. it's an interesting insight into how 
I don't care what your custom is mm -hmm. because let's be blunt. It's your custom. It's not my custom. I do not have to do this. You, just because you say you do. And yes, you created laws and you created treaties. That doesn't necessarily mean that I will abide by them. And this goes to another aspect, which is the Chinese concepts of legal warfare. Mm -hmm. And this was not, that was not legal warfare. I would suggest, however, that the 2016 arbitration of, of uh, the UN Convention of Law see uh, uh, put forth by the Philippines and decided the permanent core of arbitration. From the Chinese perspective, that was absolutely legal warfare. And more broadly speaking, activities within the so-called nine dash line is legal warfare. And here, again, going back to this context and philosophical grounding, in a world where it is ruled by law, not rule of law, the Chinese are very explicit. They have a doctrine for legal warfare. And it begins with the very important admonition. This is not about determining what is legal. This is not about finding which clause and which supporting cases can each side wheel up out of their uh, you know, abundant uh, law review articles. It is about achieving a previously established political goal where the law and all of its myriad components are tools I'm not trying to determine what is legal. I am using the law, including international law, national law, regulations, the courts, um, legal institutions, law enforcement agencies, and organizations to achieve a previously determined political end, establishing the nine dash line of sovereign boundaries, um, or in space, potentially, uh, establishing control over key places uh, you know, choke points, whether uh, at Lagrange points or on the moon or in orbit. This is not how we Westerners think of the law. And when we think of legal warfare, uh, Charles Dunlap at, at uh, Duke Law School has written extensively on this. We tend to think of legal warfare as defensive. Your job as a Navy uh, JAG, I got that right, right? Yeah, is to ideally keep your boss, Admiral so-and-so, Captain so-and-so, out of legal trouble. The Chinese legal officer, who is a military officer, I'm talking about their uniform, your uniformed counterpart, their first and foremost job is like the battalion commander, like the regimental artillery group commander, like the destroyer flotilla commander, is how do I get the mission done? not how do I keep my boss out of trouble? You know, my, my primary focus when I'm advising on these issues is uh, winning choices by decision makers. Because obviously, you know, when we work in a policy capacity, um, I'm not making law, you're not making law, we are talking about third and fourth order consequences of decisions. And from a U.S. perspective, and I've been fortunate to work with a variety of NATO allies, and also uh, counter piracy oper operations on board a South Korean warship where we had a Chinese admiral and his staff come and visit, worked with Turkish officers, Russian legal officers. Uh, it was always interesting to see how their perspective changed because from a US approach, these legal principles are baked in from the beginning with an understanding that the people have elected officials. The constitution is reflective of those universal principles of uh, first principles of justice or the overall organizational structure and goals of the society, very Star Trek in that way, right? Where after the gene wars, we've come together and we've decided this is how we're going to live and our legal documents will reflect that approach. Society will abide by that approach. And here we have the Constitution, Article 1, Article 2, that goes down to the Secretary of Defense, who has our geographic combatant commanders that have issued these military operations to do a thing, or the UN has issued a resolution to say piracy is bad, CTF-151, you have legal authority to go out and do a thing. That is very different than the operational restriction approach of a Russian, they don't have judge advocates, they have you know active duty officers that have legal interpretation and operational mission planning as a collateral duty. And my impression from my Chinese counterparts is it was the same. They're thinking in terms of mission accomplishment, just as you described. And so we have about 11 minutes left. There are no open questions. I just wanna remind people to please feel free to ask questions through the Q&A in the chat. 
I am perfectly happy to talk to Dean for 11 minutes, but I want everyone to have that opportunity to ask him questions. And I think if we could spend our last bit of time together, um, the transition from the dark, dark forest to descend, that dark forest to Terrence piece, that whole concept that the universe is teeming with life and it all wants to kill you, so you should hide was very shocking to me. I did not see that coming. It's so contrary to all of the reading, you know, that I've done since I was small in those science fiction fantasy universes. And then when Dark Forest Deterrence is gone, can you can you talk about that and and in the last few minutes really speak to whether you see how China is developing in space is trending more towards utopia, more towards empire from our Star Trek Star Wars type of paradigm. And, and what Death's End and the end of Dark Forest Deterrence kind of tells us about that. So I have to say that I thought, well, first off, this may be a translation issue, because keep in mind that the first and third books are translated by the same person. The second book was translated by a different person. Okay. But I thought that the third right. book really sort of, more than anything else, was rather nihilistic. <laughs> um, good word. <laughs> a good word. Uh, everybody dies. Uh, sorry, sorry. For those of you who have not read the book, uh, the books, um, yeah, sorry, uh, go back and edit, edit the podcast and, and delete what Mr. Change just said. Um, <laughs> but I mean, broadly speaking, and what this goes to is, I think the author is trying to make individuals can make some choice. They can still try to live a better life within the very, very ironclad boundaries set by society and history uh what the what the characters in the third book do as the universe winds and grinds towards its inexorable end is striking in not being necessary nihilist but it's their individual choices and i think that this also goes and it does sort of peel back circle back to the first book which is when we look at the great proletarian cultural revolution and the massive human cost that it entailed, um, like the Holocaust, there are individual cases of people who did the right thing. There are individual cases of people who showed humanity. Uh, you know, the, the gardens, uh, the, the, the at Yad Vashem, I think they're gardens, yeah, I believe they plant trees, you know, to people who did righteous things shows that not every was nihilistic and, and bloodthirsty but those are individual candles in the darkness and i think that that is sort of what the third book overwhelmingly grim but here's a couple of brief candles what does it say about china moving forward first off their empire is not going to have a cool theme march like Star Wars. <laughs> um, and that's because the the for us, empire is by definition flying in the face of democracy. Maybe not utopia, but democracy. And the Chinese for thousands of years were an empire, and it was perfectly good. And for the average Chinese person, it wasn't particularly bad to be part of an empire. But more to the point is, I think, it's not so much a third book as it is sort of this overall context again. A Chinese-dominated space legal structure is not going to be one that is rooted upon the consent of the government, it is not going to be rooted upon equal participation. Um, where I mean, Yang Jiechi, the Chinese State Council for Foreign Affairs, in 2001, famously said at an ASEAN regional forum presentation, there are big countries, and there are small countries, and that is simply reality. That is the reality that, you, you know, that exerts a gravity that pulls everything back down. What the Chinese have made very clear, whether it is terrestrial or in space, is that a Chinese created legal structure is going to be one where it is perfectly okay, as is true under rule by law, for me to have one set of rules and you to have a different set of rules. And guess what? My set of rules will probably be much more lenient on me. Um, 
that has other implications then, whether it is for resource extraction, scientific information and exchange, um, property rights. Uh, and here it's useful to remember spectrum is an element of property rights. Uh, it well, is I agree. And the resource. spectrum would be a wonderful conversational topic because I think it should be treated more like an area outside the jurisdiction of any one state than a piece of property. Um, but that, as you so rightly point out, um, that approach will be, is a gap that could potentially be filled in the absence of some unified decision by governing bodies, however they're represented, by the Chinese answer. And then if you want to work with China in this area, then you will follow the rule that they set. Is that, so to the theme of this uh, you know, empire or utopia, the question, utopia does imply individual empowerment. The hive mind where we all just do what we are told for yeah. the greater good of society, uh, very few would consider that utopia. Well, and the Borg are styled as not the hero in Star Correct. Wars, right? Even right. resistance is futile. But one, one interesting point is there is no gravity in space. So perhaps some of the reality that drags us crashing back down to earth can be mitigated in some kind of unforeseen way we have not yet anticipated. Um, but you, I'm gonna give you the last five minutes here. So how would you, you know, over, over to you and your big brain and share your wisdom? Uh, what I would say is for the folks who are more focused on the legal aspect than the science fiction aspect, um, that I think that, we do need to recognize when we interact with the Chinese that while in the realm of commercial law, they do often, not always, abide by international legal practice uh, in the courtroom, not necessarily in terms of like respecting intellectual property. When it comes to international law, it's very important to recognize how differently the Chinese conceive of the role and impact of international law, that it is not for dispute resolution except resolving disputes in favor of Chinese political ends. I think that that's an enormously important aspect. I would like to, however, note that pop culture, one, the Chinese actually have a concept of cultural security. It's something that we don't tend to think about. It's one of the reasons why the Chinese have tried to influence Hollywood to include in space movies a prominent Chinese role, secondary to Matt Damon and secondary to Sandra Bullock. But... <laughs> Neither of those people get to come home without a very essential Chinese role. And that's a very deliberate aspect. And that goes to the broader issue of, from their perspective, pop culture is enormously influential because there is an element of cultural security. Pop culture also shapes people's perceptions, even though it's in the background, of where is China going? Where is the United States going? The fact that there are Chinese characters on all of the warning labels and all of the product labels in Serenity is a de facto admission that China is an equal power. The same way that the Japanese neon and the Korean neon and the Blade Runner movies is a sign of the growth of, uh, of those. So it is helpful then to pay attention to Chinese pop culture and Chinese views on pop culture AKA banning BTS, for example, from China, um, to give you a sense of where things are going. And as the Chinese economy, we think slows down, as China definitely becomes ever more aggressively authoritarian, um, how that expresses itself in pop culture and how we incorporate that into our pop culture is something the Chinese are gonna be paying attention to because it's going to be, in their view, shaping perceptions of China. And conversely, how they try to produce their own fiction, science fiction, TV dramas, C-pop, uh, et cetera, is something that is not simply organically grown, but also artificially stimulated in order to influence broader perceptions. I cannot believe that our hour has gone by so quickly. <laughs> we have, very fast. It's been very fast. And I really appreciate how we've been able to dance around these different verses and show how they are similar, show how they are different, show how great power competition manifests in the future through uh, China being an equal partner and with as much influence as any other nation state. 
And then contrasting that with what we've seen in the Three Body Problem trilogy, where it's just a little different and contrary to some of those baked in expectations that a Western audience might have. I mean, this is uh, clearly a very ripe area for conversation. And um, I do hope, Dean, that we can keep talking and thinking. And uh, this is really how we're able to go through those third and fourth order consequences of those policy choices and decisions that um, our decision makers make on a regular basis. Hopefully, you know, fully informed by the best legal advice and the best policy advice that we can muster. And um, I'm really grateful to the American Society of International Law for giving this forum for the Space Law Interest Group to continue creating content that builds up that foundational awareness of these dynamic legal topics, uh, because gosh, we have to talk about it in order to conceptualize where we want these rule sets to go and what the impact these rule sets might have. Uh, so with that, uh, we will conclude. And thank you to our participants today. And thank you so very much to Mr. Dean Cheng and his insights today. Thank you for having me.